Hi, I'm Madison Mary, and welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, please consider hitting the subscribe button down below. And without further ado, let's get into my Bridgerton vlog. Hi, so I'm very excited for this reading vlog. I'm filming this intro like halfway through actually doing the vlog itself, but this is a reading vlog where I'm going to be reading all eight of the Bridgerton books, including the second epilogues. I have not watched the Bridgerton TV show and I wanted to read the books before I did because I heard from a lot of people that you needed to read up to book five in order to not be spoiled while watching the show. I'm pretty much going in not really knowing much else about the series. I do want to say that there will be a couple of spoilers in here, but I will let you know before the spoilers do occur and they'll be on the screen so you know when to skip anything. I will also have timestamps for when I read each of the books, just in case there's a specific book you want to know about. So without further ado, this is going to be a super duper long vlog, but I really, really hope that you do stick around for all of it. It has been an absolute blast to film and kind of just see what it's like. These are my first Julia Quinn books too. I have never read from her before. I have read historical romances, but never hers. And yeah, Without further ado, let's get into the start of the vlog. Just a quick disclaimer, I don't want anyone being rude in the comments or I will delete them. Not to be ominous or anything. Um, I went with my mom today to go and have some lip filler done for the first time in three years. And I was like, it's gonna be fun. But then I realized that this is gonna completely impede my vlog. And apparently I'm gonna be like this for like five days. And I was like, well, crap. So I'm just gonna have to show you. Um, Okay, so this is what they look like. <laughs> I got them done this morning and it is nighttime now. But yeah, so my initial thoughts on The Duke and I, I really love it, oh my God. It has been like a hot second since I last read a historical romance and they are just such a huge favorite of mine. There's something about historical romances that are just such a comfort read to me and that I just like, I love. I think it's going to be interesting trying to keep track of all eight children. Now I know why there's eight books is because uh, Lady Bridgerton had eight children. I'm really enjoying it though. I think that Daphne is just so, she's so witty and so smart and she's just really snarky. And you know, she knows that she's supposed to be proper in society, but she's very determined that even though she knows she has to get married, she's still, she's still holding out just a little bit, just a little bit for it to be someone who she actually falls in love with. And the premise of this first book is the fact that Simon, he's just inherited the dukedom from his father because his father passed away, but him and his dad were completely estranged because you find out in the prologue that when he was born, he had this stutter. Well, first off, he didn't speak until he was four years old. And then when he finally did speak, he had this awful, awful stutter. And so his dad was just like, oh my God, you're a moron. Like I want nothing to do with you. And like basically disowned his only son. So he grew up very resentful. And now that he's back in London because he's been traveling for years and inheriting the dukedom, he's very eligible and he like doesn't want anything to do with it. He refuses to get married and he meets Daphne because he's best friends with Anthony, the eldest British son. He meets her and you know, he finds out through talking with her that she's, she's really sick of being dragged to all these balls by her mum and being forced to you know, meet all these men. So he has just proposed with where I'm at that they pretend to court one another so that everyone gets off their backs. And that's what I'm up to. So it's fake courting, which is like the equivalent of fake dating. So I'm so excited. Okay, so I'm actually listening to the Bridgerton soundtrack as I'm reading the book, which is very fun. I highly recommend it if you uh, planning to read the book now that the series is out. I got to the scene where I feel like everyone probably knows this, like the fact that they end up getting married is the whole thing, the betrothal. It's the night before her wedding and her mum comes to talk to her about like, all like the marital acts and stuff. And it's like, she doesn't know how babies are born. She doesn't understand sex at all. Like I've read a lot of Regency romances before and I've never, had one like this. 95% of the time the woman's never had sex before she gets married. Regardless, normally when I read a historical, the woman at least knows about it. But then again, like part of me is like thinking, like, you know, this obviously makes more sense for the time. It's so weird. There's been already a lie with the marriage um, that's going on. So I, and I think now that I've gotten to where I am, I think I know probably 
what the big scene at the end is gonna be that a lot of people have an issue with. I think I, I think I knew. So I'm pretty sure I've literally done all my updates from this exact same position, but this is where I read, so this is what you get. Um, I finished the book a little earlier today and it was really fun. I was right about what I guessed when it came to the like event. And I did ask my parents about it afterwards if it was in the TV series and they, they did keep it in, which was actually kind of interesting because it is a very controversial, controversial scene. I did still think it was solid. Um, I'm probably gonna give it like a four to five stars just because I do think that there were just some things I didn't really like that happened in it that prevented it from being a five stars. The beginning, like the first half was really, really solid and I did enjoy it. And I just, I liked how their relationship started out and how they kind of developed feelings for one another and things like that. Um, I'm gonna quickly talk about that one iffy scene. So I'm just gonna shove up like a little spoiler warning. The reason why Daphne and Simon get married is because they're seen kissing and her boob is out. And so their brother is like, either you marry her or I kill you. And Daphne ends up convincing him to, car to marry her. But he says to her, look, fine, we'll get married, but you need to know like, I can't have children. And like, that's one of the things she's always wanted was to have like a big family. It, she believes from his wording that he's just like impotent. Like he literally like cannot have kids. She ends up figuring out that he just doesn't actually want to have children. And so she gets really pissed at that because she was like, well, you misled me. You made it sound like you literally could not have children. And it was something I had no control over. And then there's a scene where, you know, he goes out, he, gets drunk, he comes back still kind of plastered and she brings him into bed. And while she's lying with him in bed, she realizes that he's like gotten aroused somehow. And she's like, oh, and he's like kind of half asleep. And so she's like kind of curious. She's like, well, I wonder if I could like, I could maybe have sex with him. And she does. And then he kind of becomes slightly, he becomes aware that the sex is happening. And then just as he's like about to, you know, she, he, he, he becomes very aware of what's going on, but she's on top. So she like kind of forces him to stay while he, you know, empties into her. And so it's like her way of forcing him to like get her pregnant. And then of course, like they then don't speak for like two months. It was a very problematic scene, but I think that it's also interesting because you rarely see the woman being the sexual abuser in books. And I do think that it is important to realize that it does happen and they do have a lot of really great conversations from it like the resolution the way that they talk through everything is really great it's just and i've seen other people talk about it it's like that scene did not have to happen that way in order for those conversations to occur like they could have like it could have been gone about in a much more palatable manner the fact that a he lied to her going into the marriage that he said, oh, I can't have kids when he could. That that was like the first thing that I was like, oh, I don't like that they're going into this marriage with like this being a thing. And then of course she found out that he could and then she did that thing. And I was like, oh, this is also not good. So it's, it's, it's yeah, it's a four out of five at this point. Um, depending on how I, how I think of the other books in the series that could change. This next book is Anthony's book. So he is the eldest Bridgerton brother and like the head of the everything. And his prologue starts out with him talking about how he had always admired his dad growing up. He saw himself as like a manifestation of his father, like a complete replica. And so when his dad died at the age of 38, he now believes that he will die at the age of 38 which is really freaking weird. His whole story starts off with this prologue of him being like, you know, I do, like I, I plan on getting married someday, but you know, it's just gonna suck for my wife because she'll probably get pregnant and then I'll die. And I'm like, <laughs> sir, are you okay? Like, oh. So this is gonna be interesting. But yeah, that's all for now. Hey, so I just wanna do a quick update on the book. So I, it's really frustrating reading a bind up of three books because I literally have no idea whatsoever where I am up to. So they're at the um, estate in the countryside where basically Lady Bridgerton ended up inviting a bunch of eligible women for the season to try and find her sons a wife. 
more specifically Anthony Ewife. He meets Edwina who is like the pearl of this season. He's like, you know what? She's nice, pretty, smart, well respected. You know, she, she's a good egg. So you know I'm gonna pick her. I'm gonna marry her because I'm gonna die anyway and at least she'd be a good person. I don't have to worry about falling in love with her. I don't, I don't like her like that, but she'd be perfect. But Kate's like, mm, no, you are rake and that ain't happening. She's my baby sister and this shit ain't happening. And so she's like very determined to not like let that happen. And so they have this like hateful band between the two of them because she completely does not trust him. She does not believe anything he says. She thinks he's just the worst of the worst. And he kind of plays a little bit into it from time to time, but he's also very upset at himself because he feels something towards her. Ever since he first met her, he's felt like this bond between the two of them. And he's like, mm, this is a no-no zone. We're not, I'm not, no. No. Whereas on her behalf, we really haven't seen much of her like actually wanting to be with him. So I don't think I'm that far into the book. I think I'm probably like around about halfway. And then there's the fact that when I read the epilogue, the second epilogue of Duke and I, there was a thing at the end that said that she, Julia Quinn, decided while writing the second book who she wanted Lady Whistledon to be. And that she then went back into book one to double check that she hadn't like done anything to discount that person as a potential. So I'm trying to like think of who we met in book one. That could be Lady Whistledon. Part of me thinks it was the old lady whose house Simon and Daphne first met at. I think it's that old lady. I have no idea what her name is. I think it could be her or I think it could be maybe a Featherington. I don't think it's Lady Featherington. I think it could be one of her three daughters. I think that would make a lot of sense. Penelope would technically be like my first thought, but then I know that she is who Colin ends up with. We find that out at the end of the epilogue. And I know that Colin's book is book four and we find out who Lady the Whistledon is in book five. So that, that discounts Penelope at least. But I will admit that Lady Whistledon doesn't have as big of a role in this book as she did in the first book. And I don't know if that's just because our two characters just don't focus too much on that. Also because Anthony's been talked about a lot, but Kate really isn't. She's kind of like a wallflower in a sense. She's a great heroine. And there's a whole scene where they're playing like this um, mallet game and she is just a Fiend. She's awful at it. Um, and it is just, it's just really fun. So this one definitely has a lot more snarky banter in it than the first one. Part of me does prefer this one already a lot more to the first one. Yes, that's it. Good evening. Okay, so here's my update. I finished the second book and I loved it. I loved it so much. Like five stars. Loved it so much. So I think that for sure, the first book, The Duke and I, is gonna be like 3.5, four stars, just depending on how the rest of the series goes. But I just, I love them. They had some of the best banter ever. And just like the way that they came about their romance because they were both so reluctant to like actually fall in love with each other as they were falling in love. It just made for like such great content. And Kate, she, can give it as well as she gets it and so it's just it's hilarious to see her like always like biting back and stuff like that like I adore it like the second epilogue I found out there's a second epilogue for all the books um and the second epilogue this one is a recount of another like Paul Mall Pal Mal whatever the mallet game is it's another version of that um 10 years after they've been married and it is like <clears throat> hilarious like the two of them are just so funny together i i adore them i really i really do the issue that they had and the way that it was resolved i do really enjoy it because there was slight miscommunication but there was also when it was resolved it was a lot of open communication a lot of open dialogue between the two of them so once again i still don't know who Lady Whistledon is. There are like certain articles from Lady Whistledon and she's like i wasn't invited to this affair but i heard so it discounts certain characters unless she says that just like through people of her scent. Now I was thinking it was Lady Danbury, but then in each of the epilogues, which take place like 10, 15 years after the book finishes, she still exists. And if it was Lady Danbury, I'm pretty sure she'd be like a hella hella old lady at this point in time. And so I'm like, is it really viable for it to be her? My guess is no. So I don't have a clue anymore. Gosh, it's so difficult. Like, um, I don't know. But yeah, so I started book three 
and this is Benedict, his book. What's really interesting about this one, I've only read the prologue for it. So this one was Sophie and she is basically going to be a Cinderella story. I can already tell that. Now I'm not sure how that's going to go for me because I'm not the biggest fan of retellings. Basically, she's a bastard of an earl. He refuses to acknowledge her as this bastard. She just, he just has her living with him as a ward. And then when she's 10 years old, he ends up marrying the countess that he ends up, you know, bringing in and having. She has two daughters. The wife says to her, like, you can't speak to her, you have to be mean to her, all these things. Like, they don't treat her well at all. And she's basically like, ignored. And then he dies of a heart attack. And in the will, it stipulates, okay, my lovely countess, you can either choose to get £2,000 a year as my will to you, or if you decide to keep looking after my daughter until she is 20, you can get £6,000 a month. And she's like, well, you know what? I will keep looking after her, but I'm gonna make her be a maid. And that's, that's, that's all I know so far. And so if that doesn't scream Cinderella to you, I don't know what does. Okay, right, I'll update you when I've read a significant chunk more of the third book. Bye. Took way too long to update you on the third book. <laughs> I am like, not much left. The very first chapter is her, you know, doing the whole Cinderella thing, like going to the masquerade ball, meeting him and all that stuff. And then the next chapter, she ends up like getting kicked out of the house because the stepmom finds out that she went and she's like, mm -mm, I don't have to look after you anymore, you're 20, so bye. She kicks her out. And then it goes to like two years later and then they end up meeting again, but he has no recollection that it's her because she looks totally different. She ends up having to nurse him back to health because he ends up saving her from the situation and then they end up escaping from it on the on a horse and then it starts raining and he gets sick. Out of all the ones so far, this is the one with like the biggest class difference because I mean, during this time, like being a bastard is more disgraced, but she is of a, higher social class and she kind of presents herself she presents herself like as a maid and so she thinks of herself as that position socially benedict only knows her in that position so he also like as much as he becomes infatuated with her he knows that like he he can't marry her because of this whole social standing situation so it's interesting because this is the first one that's kind of had to deal with that as an issue between the characters. And also this is the first one where their characters haven't like had the situation where it's like, oh, you've been caught in a compromising situation. So you have to get married. Like the first two did that. And I was kind of like, mm, okay, this happened a second time. I was like, okay. So I like that that's not what's happening in this one that is like a little bit different because that whole compromise situation thing, it's fine to read every once in a while, but like, it's not like my favorite trope of all time, unless it's like hate to love and then they're like, anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. You could, without a doubt, read the third book without reading anything else. Like it is so different from all the others. Like you barely see anyone else who's like a part of the family. You barely kind of have to know what's gone on previously, like in this world. The only character you really kind of meet is Lady Bridgerton and Eloise, and Eloise you kind of barely see throughout all the books, so you're kind of just starting to get to know her now, which is also, like, you know, it's important because her, she's like in the next two books. So yeah, I like it. Like, they have some really good banter. There's definitely a lot more sexual tension, like a lot more kissing and a lot more like in this book than the other ones. I don't know, for some reason, like I'm not totally driving with it, but there have been like some really, like this is the one that I've highlighted the most. Like there's some really great moments in this, just like quote wise and like just their banter is really on point because it's totally different from the banter of the last book because Sophie, she's tries to be like a really nice person, but he just, he brings up the worst in her that they just tease the crap out of each other. They're so sarcastic to one another. And so it's, it's really fun. I'm also just like really frustrated that like he he doesn't know who she is or like she hasn't said anything yet i think that's like my biggest gripe with it is i'm just like oh my god when's he gonna find out like when's everything gonna happen like i'm just i'm constantly waiting for that and so i think that's like kind of ifing it oh a little psa though uh the book starts out what he saves her from he saves her from being raped so like there's no actual on-page rape but there is like an a, a kind of an attempt so just do you know that okay Goodbye. Hey, okay, so it is the next day. I haven't read anything today because I ended up, what did I do this morning? I applied to internships and then I spent the rest of the day filming TikToks. It was really fun.
Okay. Can you not show your ass to the internet? It's kind of rude. So I did finish the book last night. I liked it. It was an interesting ending, but definitely cool. And I definitely love the second epilogue for this one a lot because it was different from the other two second epilogues in which this one didn't... <laughs> <laughs> this one didn't actually focus on our couple it focused on posy the sweet stepsister and so that was really nice because it was kind of like a little bonus like novella like one shot story kind of i say one shot if you're like familiar with mangas but you know it was nice it was sweet i think i would definitely put it like on par with um daphne and simon it just it felt so different from the others like there were just some moments that i just didn't vibe with it as much especially because it was kind of strange that he was so adamant about having her be his mistress when he was like trying to be so respectful of her and like i get like that during that time like that was the only choice like if, like, if she's a maid like of being still low social class the only way that they could have any semblance of a relationship it would be if she was a mistress but it was still something that was like, mm, like the way that he just kept pushing it was like, oh, mm, bro, really? So I don't know. But um, I did start book number four and I'm so shocked by it. So I didn't, I think I'm like, I don't remember. I think I'm 20% through it. I stayed up until 5 a.m. to buy Empire the Vampire from Waterstones last night. So like I'm half dead at the moment. Penelope Featherington is... 28 years old so she's like i'm a spinster i'm on the shelf right now and it's really interesting to kind of have seen her grow throughout all these years because i was curious how they're going to do it and none of these books go back in time like they all keep on going forward and forward and forward which i think is really interesting so colin is 33 and she's 28 and it's you know going to be their romance except for the fact that like so an event that happened in the last book is what spurred on a lot of the things going on now so the first three you could read out of order but after that it seems to me like you start having to you know you need the background in order for things to make sense like i can't see anyone reading penelope and colin's book and like actually getting the full weight of it without having read the other ones but this one's really cool i'm actually kind of curious as to why people are saying that lady whistledon is revealed in book five because i feel like it sounds like she's going to be revealed in this book because what this one centers around is the fact that lady danbury is offering a 1000 pound reward for anyone who finds out the actual identity of Lady Whistledon. And that's because like, it's just a really boring season. And then Colin doesn't want to get married, but like he does want to get married, but like he doesn't really know what's going on. Also, we've just learnt he's a writer at heart. He has journals, which is really cute. Also Penelope and Eloise are spinsters together. They're so cute. And so I'm really excited for the next story, which is Eloise's. I'm actually falling in love with just like following this family. It's been a while since I've kind of blown through a series like this. So I am taking the day off today from reading anything just because I've been reading a book every two days <laughs> recently. And um, I mean, that's fine, but it's just, I'm a little burnt out at the moment um, with all the filming I did today. Filming takes a lot of energy out of you. I still think that maybe Lady Danbury is Lady Whistledon. It has to be someone that we've met since book one. And I, I just, I don't, no, we can't be a Featherington because they were constantly shat on in the Whistledon papers. <sighs> Hello. Um, also, another one of my Hello Lovely Books uh, t-shirts came in and it says Moody Readers Club on here. And, you know, I just, I love it because I do. Um, I also like this color. Like, I don't own any tops that are like this. Now I'm just staring at myself in the viewfinder like a narcissist. Anyway, um, I finished. Book four today, and I'm gonna go completely into spoilers now because I don't really know how to talk about it otherwise. Um, I'm just gonna really struggle. So, spoiler warning. So, <laughs> Penelope is Lady Whistledon, and I, I, I really did not see that coming. I never would have guessed it would have been her, and I, I don't like that it's her. I really don't. I just don't think it makes like I get I get it and I did like the overall storyline with how this book went with like 
her talking about how much she loves to write and like the fulfillment she got from it and also like how it was like her thing and how proud she was of it and then how she like helped Colin with his writing like that was really sweet like I love that whole aspect of it I just feel like I needed more from like her being Lady Whistledown like I just feel like it was like I just did not really believe it and then like just their romance I was so into them I was so into them until it was their book and then I was just kind of like ah oh. like they're like she was so enamored with him for years and years and years and then he kind of fell for her really quickly there was something missing from their romance and you know like he was jealous of her the entire time and he was a bit controlling like there was this one part where like he's grabbing her arm to like stop her from doing stuff and she says like how he's hurting her and so I just I don't know I did love reading from Penelope's POV and like I loved being with her brain and following her and her being a spinster and seeing all that but I I'm really sad I'm really really sad this one does end with the second epilogue revealing what happens for the next book which is Eloise's book and that's the fact that at the end of this book she ends up running away to go elope with this man <laughs> So I'm very, I'm really actually excited to read the next book because I'm just like, what the heck, Eloise? What you been doing, girl? <laughs> Will I take every clip in my bed? Probably. <laughs> but I am reading book five at the moment, Eloise's book. I like it a lot. It's actually one of the funniest ones out of them all, mostly just because Eloise is a hilarious, hilarious protagonist to follow. This book actually reminds me of something else I read, The Governess Game by Tessa Dare. And I say that because it follows, you know, this woman who ends up coming into a house and ends up caring for these children who are just complete and utter like monsters and hate anyone who comes in. So in The Governess Game, the two children would run off all the governesses and in this one, the two children run off like literally anyone. And so Eloise has been sending letters to this man named Sir Philip. And after a year, he's like, hey, you should come to my estate and we can see if we suit each other and maybe marry. And she's like, you know what? Okay. And so she goes and it's about her going there. And, you know, she doesn't actually, the way the book four ends is you're like, you find out that Eloise has just like disappeared and they're all like, what happened to her? because she secretly leaves to go to his estate to see him. And she gets there and he doesn't expect her and the two children that, and she, she didn't even know he had kids, okay? Um, he's a widower, by the way, he's a widower. This is a widow romance. He's shocked because he like, didn't expect her to be there. And he's also like, he's very guilty because he feels like he's a bad dad. And he kind of is like a bad dad. He kind of avoids his children at all costs just because they're eight years old and they're twins and they just create such a ruckus and they make his life a living hell basically. But it's because they basically just want attention. They want him to pay attention to them. And so they're literally awful children because of that. But he's also a botanist, which is cool. And he's a baron. That's why he's called Sir Philip is because he's a baron. But she gets there and he's dull AF and she's like what have I done like I have I really messed this up and then the two children like start like pranking her and she gets all fired up because of this because obviously she's she's Eloise Bridgerton she has four brothers and three sisters like she knows how to deal with these children and so it's hilarious watching her play back with them and like prank them back and like all these different things and to just see her like really relating to these children because it's what she's used to because she's a Bridgerton, you know, massive family. I'm not totally feeling the romance between the two of them. I just think that it's just, it's not exactly like my total cup of tea. He's just looking for a wife so she, he has someone to look after the children. Because yes, he has a bad history. You know, he had an abusive dad and his wife committed suicide. So like he has a bad backstory, but like that doesn't ex... I just wish that he was more like loving. He's very reserved. I just, I don't like him. <laughs> I love her, but I don't like him. One thing I want to mention is that we do get to see a lot more Benedict and Sophie in this book because the dude, Sir Philip, <laughs> I forgot his name. He lives, he lives only an hour away from them in the countryside. So I am really liking that we're seeing so much more of them and it's definitely like making me grow on them a lot more. And it's making me like think back to their romance and I'm a bigger fan of their romance than when I did initially read it. The more I kind of see of them and how they are, the more I'm like, it's definitely like a four star book. Like book three is definitely like a four. I was just complaining about how I was like, mm, I don't really understand their relationship. I'm literally crying at their relationship right now. Like I'm tearing up.
I cannot even. This conversation that they're having, he's such a sad man. He's such a sad man. Hello and welcome back to Madison doesn't like to sit in proper positions when she updates you. I just finished the book. It's been probably like 15 minutes. Oh, it's downloaded. I just downloaded um book number six, When He Was Wicked, which is uh, Francesca's book, which I'm very excited about because we legitimately know negative information about her. And I say that because in the last book, I think it was book four, you find out that she got married and then widowed within two years. It was just like thrown in as a fact. And I was like, oh, okay. Wow, I have such mixed feelings about Eloise's book. Like it's, I guess just because like I've never read a romance as slow burn as theirs for a historical like there's always like some sexual tension between the characters like off the bat and for them it just it wasn't like that like theirs was truly a slow burn romance and it was really interesting i do think that it ended beautifully i liked the epilogue i loved the second i loved the second <laughs> I loved the second epilogue for this one because it follows Amanda when she's 19 and it's like a mini diary. These epilogues are getting better and better as they go on. It's really interesting. When I get to reading, I'm probably gonna sit in this position to read, which is not great for my back, but whatever. <laughs> okay, hey. I have a package to open that is relevant to this vlog. Why? Because this is <laughs> a Julia Quinn book. Um, I got like 30% I think into uh, Francesca's book last night. It's really interesting. Um, not going the way that I thought it was gonna go at all, but I'm definitely 100% feeling the love interest in this book. I think he's, apart from Anthony, he's like my favorite love interest that we've had so far. I just really vibe with him. Even though he has the same name as my cousin, which is always creepy, but it's Michael, by the way. I love him. He's really awesome. And just, oh my God, he's like a rake with a heart of gold. You know what I mean? So we, we stand that always. Oh, oh my gosh, she has a little thank you note. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay, so I bought a book off of Mercari. Oh my God. I love buying things off my car because the people are always so sweet. Oh my god. 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 <laughs> so here it is. The Duke and I. And then there's a sign. And look at the back. This was like the number one reason why I had to get this copy because this step back is legit. Like the nicest one I own. I'm like dying over this. I can't even get over it. I have class in like five minutes, so I'm not really having time to talk to you about the book. But like I said, it is a widow romance. So it starts out with the night that Francesca's husband dies. And it's a romance between her, like years and years later, and Michael, who is her dead husband's cousin. But they're more like brothers because so Michael and her husband, their dads were twins. Her husband's dad is older than his dad, so he ended up being like the um, Earl or like the Count, or whatever the hell it is. And so he now rules everything. And then he dies and now it goes to Michael, but then it turns out that Francesca's actually pregnant. So they're like, oh, actually could it go to Francesca's baby if it's a boy, but then she miscarries. Um, this is all within the first like two, yeah, two chapters. Um, so there is a warning obviously for death of a loved one and miscarriage. So do be aware that going in, it is like very detailed and there's a lot of like grief and depression that our characters go through. And then you flash forward four years where they finally meet again. He's like, hey, it's time for me to actually take over and be like the count. And she's like, I want a baby. So I want to find someone to marry so that I can actually finally have a child. So that's kind of what it's about. And he's always been in love with her. Like for him, it was love at first sight, but obviously he couldn't be with her because it was his brother slash best friend slash cousin's wife. And so he's like, I mean, I can never be with her. Oh, I've got class in a couple minutes. And we shall see how this keeps on going. I, I really think this one has a lot of potential to be the second five stars of this series. So fingers crossed for that. Okay, so I, I have to go to bed because it's, I don't even know what time it is. Hang on. <laughs> 2.40 in the morning. Um, 
I told myself, I was like, Madison, you're up 46% through this book. Just get to 50 and you can go to bed. I'm at 71. And even now I literally had to make, really, can you not? I had to make myself stop. I love this book <laughs> so much. The sexual tension in it is ridiculous. And out of all of them, this one is the sexiest by far. The scenes that we are getting in this book are unlike any of the other ones. And it is so good. Like, oh my God, this is what I've been waiting for. I've read so many historical romances that are more akin to like this level of steam. And I have been waiting for Julia Quinn's books to reach this level of steam and it's finally happened. I'm finally getting the steam that I've always craved. I'm, 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 I'm loving it. Like watching her slowly kind of realize her feelings for him because they both have this same distraughtness between the two of them where they feel this guilt and grief towards John and they're feeling like they are kind of dishonoring him in some sense. They're just also so perfectly suited for one another. I mean, yes, her and John were really sweet in the beginning when you got to see them together, but there was also this connection between Francesca and Michael that like always made sense. So this book does take place during the exact same time period as romancing Mr. Bridgerton. So we actually see Colin and Penelope get engaged halfway through this book, which I'm guessing means that because in the last book, Francesca didn't make it to Eloise's wedding because she was still in Scotland. I'm guessing this is also gonna go through Eloise's book too. Okay, this might be like a little bit, you know what? I'm just gonna put like a little spoiler warning just so I can get into this. So her and Michael end up having sex twice so far. They just did it a second time. And the second time she's like taken over. She's like, you know what? If I'm gonna do this, like I'm gonna do it my way. Because you know what? I was a I was a wife for two years and you know my my husband he had he had he had he was healthy. He had his desires. And so you know what? I'm gonna take full advantage of the situation. You know, he's a rake. He was a rake. He he knows his stuff, but you know what? I can take advantage of that too and it's her literally just like taking control of the situation, like rendering him like speechless and it was just, it was so good. It was so good. Oh my god. I love them. I love them so much. I'm literally obsessed. Obsessed. I can't. Okay. I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. Okay. Hello. So, believe it or not, um, you probably can't believe it. I don't know why. <laughs> Ugh. Um, it's been actually a couple of days since I last updated you. I think it's, I think it's been like three. Most because I didn't read it all in those three days because, um, Little, oh, little princess here wasn't feeling very well. She was a bit sick these last couple of days. And so I've been a very worried cat mama and she was taking up all my attention. If, if I wasn't studying for my classes, I was worrying about the little nugget. Um, but she's, she's doing well now, which is good. Yeah, so tonight I finished uh, Francesca's book freaking just I loved it I loved it so much five out of five stars I do really want to mention um especially towards the end and in the epilogues that there's a lot of talk about Francesca's infertility and the struggles she has with trying to get pregnant and how literally everyone else is in the epilogue especially um getting pregnant before her and all the talks about that um I think honestly I can say this is actually taken over book two for me I thought Anthony and Kate were going to be like my number ones but no, Francesca and Michael are like my favorite ever. I'm like, I'm so giddy over them. Like I almost cried when she was like struggling with infertility and everything. Oh, oh, I love them. I love them so, 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 so much. Like, <laughs> and um, there's this one line in the second epilogue that is from Violet's POV. It says, Violet loves all of her children equally, but she loves them all differently. And I was like, oh my God, if that is like not the most accurate sentence about like parents and their children, like, wow. So I did just start book seven, Hyson's book, and it's between Hyson and Gareth St. Clair, who we had met, I think like maybe once in one of the previous books or like his name had been mentioned, but he is actually Lady Danbury's nephew. <laughs> and you guys know I love Lady Danbury. Well, you find out obviously when this book starts that Hyacinth is actually very close to Lady Danbury and they are very similar. And you learn very early on that like, <laughs> she, <laughs> Hyacinth is like in her fourth season now and each season she gets less and less marriage proposals because 
men are terrified of her because she is so smart and so outspoken and like she doesn't care that she presents herself that way in society and so men are like mm, she's nice but we don't really want to marry her even though she has like nothing else wrong so yeah and then Gareth St. Clair you learn in his prologue of the prologue of the book he is a bastard son but society doesn't actually know he's a bastard and he's a second son to Lord St. Clair and Lord St. Clair wanted to marry him off when he was 18 because he was like, you're useless, like I don't, I'd never wanted you. They had an awful relationship, him and his dad, who wasn't actually even his dad anyway. He's like, N I'm not doing that. And he's like, well then I'm cutting you off. So then Gareth said, fine, do that. And he left his house and he went and became, went to Lady Danbury's and she took him in. Cause you know, nephew and all that good stuff. And that's what he's had for the last 10 years. But when the book begins, um, you know, in chapter one, his older brother passed away the year before without any male heirs. So now the Lordum has Lordum? Lord, the Lordship, <laughs> I don't know, has passed to him. So now, you know, he actually has to eventually inherit it. And he's like, oh no, no. I don't know how I feel about this because I just, I don't see how my dad is gonna let me actually inherit it because he hates me. I'm very, very excited to see how their romance goes because I definitely can feel that like he's already kind of feeling her and she's already just like, yeah, no, this is not like, I'm, I'm good, thanks bro. So. <laughs> I think it's gonna be him trying to woo her and that's gonna be like just so so good But this takes place also after the last book which is kind of nice because It's it's nice that we've kind of caught up on the timeline because it does get a bit confusing when everything's like all over the shop But um, I've also been watching everyone's historical romance vlogs for like the historical romance readathon like Lacey and Lisa and Jess's and Avery's and oh my god, I was watching uh, Lacey's today. This is so off topic. But obviously if you're watching this, you like historical romance. Like those are four booktubers that you should definitely check out if you like historical romances because they're like the queens. But anyway, I was watching Lacey's <laughs> and the whole time she would like hold up a book. I was like screenshot, screenshot. I don't know if anyone else does this, but I have all these screenshots of people on my phone holding up books. Now I have like all these ones I really want to read because I'm just like in a kick at the moment. Zelda, you're not going out there. It's not happening. But yeah, okay, that's a bit long for this update, but I did just want to like come on here and kind of just like give it. Oh my god, that was my <laughs> Did that come up? I don't know if that came up on the audio, but my shoulders just totally cracked. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's too funny. Okay. Um yeah. All right. So I'm like sixty <laughs> percent into this book, and oh my god, I love this one too. It's great, great. Um, Hyacinth is literally a riot and a half. I am having so much fun with her. She's just like perfection. She's perfection. I love her. She's. Just She's great. She's really great. The amounts of Lady Danbury that we're seeing is also just like so, so much fun to be a part of. And I just, I just love the banter and like how well matched Hyacinth and Gareth are. Like they literally, like they compliment each other so much. It's just like, it's so, <laughs> this one is prime spot on. <sighs> what time is it? Oh, oh. It's 3 a.m. Oh. Should I go to bed? Oh, I'll read to 70% and we'll go from there. Oh, also there is a slight mystery subplot to this one. I just thought it'd be fun to mention it. Oh, goodbye. Okay, so like I'm fully aware that I said I was going to read to 70% and that was at 3 a.m. It is currently 4 a.m. and I finished the book. <laughs> Oopsies. It was such a blast. It's the quickest I've read any of them. I don't even know what to say. I'll talk to you about it in the morning because I'm like incoherently tired right now and the air conditioning's blasting like no other human being in the world. Hello, hello, hello. I just got done filming some videos. 
And I was like, well, this package arrived, so I might as well open it for the vlog. And then I also got to talk to you about the book I read last night. And the, I, started, I started the last book as well. I only got like 5% into it, but you know. eBay order of one of the books. Um, let's see if it is in good condition. We're gonna find out very quickly. <laughs> this is so sweet. Wow, this is in like perfect condition. I thought there would be a step back with this. I can never tell, like whenever they have this, I always think there's gonna be a step back. We have When He Was Wicked. Wow, I'm actually so shocked this came in like such great, like this doesn't even look like it's ever been read. I'm gonna look into like the step backs because I definitely want, okay, look, it's great. It came in great condition, but she can't stand for the life of her. So I'm just gonna, Let's get into the book. So Gareth Sinclair and High Center. Oh my God. I, you saw me. I read it in one I read it in one sitting. I followed through it. It was amazing. I just love the two of them. I love the whole storyline of it. It was just hilarious. I already told you guys the reason why they're in this story together and High Center is 22 and Gareth is 28. She is still in her seasons and he's definitely like considered like the rakish age, which makes sense because he is a rake. What I realized as I read this series up until this point is that each of the books from the beginning till now, they get steamier and steamier as they go on. And I don't know if that's just because maybe Julia Quinn has like, uh, that's just how she evolved as an author. She started off a bit more conservative and then kind of grew into it. But definitely in the last two books in Francesca's and in Hyson's books, they were definitely more promiscuous as women, they definitely knew what they wanted from their men. They weren't afraid to, you know, say their opinions of what they wanted in the bedroom or they didn't have any qualms about taking control. The steam between her and Gareth is definitely there. I adored the crap out of it. I loved all their banter. They probably have the best banter out of all of the couples easily. It just, it really flowed as a story and I did love the whole kind of mystery subplot to this one. So Gareth gets a diary from his great great grandmom and it's written in Italian and he's like, I want to be able to read this, but I cannot. And so he brings it to his grandmother, you know, Lady Danbury to be like, hey, do you know anyone who can translate this? And Hyacinth's in the room and she's like, oh, I read Italian. And he's like, mother, really? Really? Of course you, of course you do. And so that's kind of how they start a lot of their correspondence with one another is that she's translating this diary for him. And so they're finding out a lot about like his ancestry and everything that he came from and all that kind of stuff. So it was really cool in that sense. And um, the whole mystery subplot to that is they discover some things through that diary that they then become very enamored with. And I did love the epilogue for this one, both of the epilogues, the original and the second one. The second one was definitely what I wanted um, because it, because the mystery was not solved in the book. And I was like, I'm so annoyed. But then the mystery was solved in the second epilogue. Thank God, otherwise I would have been so annoyed. I was like, I need to know, like, does she like, ah. Like if you've read the books, you'll understand. I mentioned yesterday, you know, my favorite historical romance booktubers, but I just came across someone new today. And that is Jessen Reed's Romance. Um, I found her historical romance vlog. It just like popped up in my recommended. And I was like, oh, I've never, never heard of her before. And I started watching it and I'm like in love with her. She only has 3K followers. So definitely go check her out and subscribe to her channel because I fell in love with her. I got like five minutes into her video and I was like, I love you and submitted that as a comment. And I'm like, I hope I did not just scare this poor girl away <laughs> because I wanted to be my friend. I'm still only a halfway through the vlog because I've been filming all day today, but I was like, oh my God, like screenshotting different ones I want to try out. And like, I just, I'm on a historical romance kick right now. And I'm so annoyed because <laughs> I mean, it's, it's February tomorrow. So I need to actually read a bunch of arcs. So my goal actually is to read book eight completely today so that I will have read the entire Bridgerton series completely in January, which is nuts. But um, I'm gonna try and read all of Gregory's book tonight. Now, that being said, I did begin it last night and it was like a bit of a shock to me. So it takes place a year after Hyson's book. So it's kind of nice that we, we were still going line linearly. But basically Gregory, from the synopses, he has fallen in love with this girl who does not love him back. And then there's this other girl named Lucy who is in love with Gregory, but she's actually betrothed to someone else. And then Gregory ends up falling for Lucy and they fall for each other, 
but she's still betrothed to someone and so there's a whole problem and so when the book starts out it's a prologue that happens and it's him running to a church getting in there and being like don't marry him marry me and like stopping the whole wedding and it pauses just before she gives her response to him asking her to marry and then it goes two months prior which i'm guessing is when everything takes place so two months for this to happen is just kind of nuts to me because i'm like Whoosh, so much just happened i'm very excited for this one and yeah goodbye <laughs> oh my god um Okay, so I'm 57 percent in, and I'm and I'm gonna have to spoil right now because we just learned something. <laughs> oh my god, we just learned something, so I'm just gonna do spoilers. Um, so we've all known we've known since the beginning who she was engaged to, and just the last chapter, Gregory found out, and he goes, "Oh, you're marrying him," and she goes, "Yeah, is is there a problem?" And he goes, "No, no, like he." He, he's he's gonna be a nice a nice husband to you and she's like I don't know and then you know a lot of chapters back at the very beginning um when her brother and she were talking about it he was like you know he's gonna be really nice to you and she was like there's something going on here that he's not telling me and now in this chapter Gregory <laughs> Gregory's like Someone's gonna tell her. Someone's gonna tell her that, you know, yeah, he's gonna be a wonderful husband, but um, it's not gonna be a regular marriage because uh, Hillsby doesn't like ladies. He's gay. And I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> this is actually interesting because it's the first time in any of these books we've come across someone who isn't straight. But like I said, I am 57% of the way through. It's fine. It's nothing like special or breathtaking. I think at this point it's kind of... I think it's kind of on the same level as Eloise's book at this point. Okay, so let me properly explain it. So when it starts off, Gregory is like, I believe in love. You know, I know it's gonna happen to me someday. I'll see the person who I'm meant to be with and I'll just know. And he walks in to um, like Kate is having a like a couple day long party thing going on. He walks in and he sees this girl. He sees the back of her and he, he's just like, that's it. That's my woman. That's who I'm meant to be with. And that is Miss Hermione Watson. And then obviously Hermione Watson's best friend is Lady Lucinda Abernathy, who is Lucy, who is our female point of view in this story. So we follow for the first 35 to 40% of Gregory being absolutely 1659 percent in love with Hermione and it's funny because I loved having listened to his POV because she was just like everyone loves her every man loves her and this happens every single time and so she decides to help him in like attaining Hermione's uh hand and that's kind of how they forge this friendship between the two of them I don't know the whole beginning with him being like completely in love with Hermione it was just like <sighs> That was like totally boring, like I was just not feeling that. So I'm definitely appreciating the rest of this at the moment. We're currently a week out from her wedding. You know, it's fine. It was nice to see a bunch more of Kate, because I've missed Kate. She's, you know, one of my faves. Ooh, did I, I think I last updated you when I was reading the final book. I did finish it that same night. I did like it. I adored the crap out of Lucy. I just think that as much as I did enjoy it, the beginning, the whole start with his infatuation with Harriet, that was just, it went on for too long that it kind of messed up the whole pacing of the book. So even though I adored the book from there, like the ending of his infatuation onwards, it didn't really make up for it. Oh, oh my God, I do want to put a spoiler warning or, and also a trigger warning, more so, um, for the second epilogue. It is... Mm, okay. This is actually, no, it's not a spoiler. It's more of a trigger. Um, so if you have ever n known someone who has struggled after birth with immense blood loss and, like, almost dying and, like, complications, do not read the second epilogue because it is extremely hard to read and very distressing because Lucy gives birth to her <laughs> eighth and ninth children, um, twins. And she, they're like, we have to stop after this. But then 
after she gives birth, she like half dies. And so there's like a lot of talk about that. And it was just, it was very heavy. Um, it's interesting, you know, the second epilogues are either really sweet and light and just beautiful, or they're just like in your face, just like, oh my stars, like that, okay. So the next time I update you will be when I rank all the books. So, yes. So, um, it's been a hot minute. <laughs> I'm literally, I was just about to start editing the vlog when I realized that I never actually closed it out because I was just waiting for my copies to come in and all that stuff. I have managed to collect each and every one of the books. They each have a step back except for an offer from a gentleman, which is so annoying. I've tried to track it down with a step back and it is just super duper hard. People want exceedingly high prices for it. And I just, I can't in good conscience, I spent way too much buying each of these that I just, I can't. I need to stop. Okay. They are basically all used except for I think two of them actually have really good condition But I'm going to show you each of the covers and tell you my final rating for all of them and also the final ranking for all of them Oh, and just quickly before I, I show you them all and give you like the ratings and stuff. Um Historical romance for Edith sweatshirt from Hello Lovely Box are amazing. I think yes this is still available on their store and you can use the code princess15 to get 50% off when you buy one and I love it. I live in their sweatshirts. Obviously like it's hot right now so I'm not wearing it but <laughs> you get what I mean. Okay, let's go into the ratings. So here we have Romancing Mr. Bridgerton and here is the beautiful step back. This one I ended up giving a 2.5 stars. It is my lowest rated one of them all. It was fine but I just, I didn't feel for it. Then next up we have these three, which I all gave three stars to. On the way to the wedding, which is the one that's in like the nicest condition. It doesn't have like any markings on it at all. I don't think it's even been read. But here is the step back of this one. The Duke and I with this gorgeous step back. To Sir Philip with love with this beautiful step back. Coming at four stars is an offer from a gentleman. This is why I'm so annoyed that I do not have the step back of it. This is just like the regular book. It's it's really good condition. It's never been like it's barely been read or anything. And it's got like a really pretty picture here, which I know would be the step back if I owned it, but uh, it's fine. And then these three are my five star books. The Viscount Who Loved Me has <laughs> this wonderful, wonderful step back. And It's In His Kiss has this beautiful step back. Just, I love it. And then my number one favorite of them all is When He Was Wicked, which... <laughs> I just, I love them. I love them so much. They're like my number one favorite. Like I'm just, if, if I could give this six stars, I would give it six stars. So yeah, I mean, that's what I thought of the series. I really did enjoy it. This was so much fun. Um, if you did stick around this long, uh, comment a, I'm trying to think of like what would kind of fit all these books. I, I really don't know what would fit all these books. Um, comment a, a crown, a crown emoji. Why? Because some of these books were queen. <laughs> I don't really know, but um, that's what I'm gonna do. I like doing this like in my longer vlogs. I like being like, if you made it to the end, do this, because I think it's like a cute fun thing and it always just makes me happy when I see them in the comments. But yeah, if you did enjoy this video, please like button down below. If you wanna see more of me, please go to my channel and until next time, thanks a bunch, bye.